in the last couple of videos, we've gone over the idea that the Federal Reserve manages the money supply by setting a target interest rate. And there might have been the obvious question circling in your brain. Why don't they just manage the money supply by instead of setting a target interest rate, why don't they set a target money supply? They could say that we want the M0 to be, let me make sure I have the, they could say we have a target M0 of, I don't know, $900 billion. And they just, if it's at $800 billion now, they just print that much $100 billion more of base money or Federal Reserve deposits or Federal Reserve notes, and then the M0 will get to 900 billion. And then you'll have the multiplier effect, and more lending will take place, and then you'll increase the M1. So similarly, they could have a target M1. They could say, we want the M1, which is the M0 plus uh, checking de deposit account. So essentially, anything that can be used for money. So actual cash, reserve deposits, or uh, you know, checking accounts can be used for money, because you can write checks against them. So they could say, we, are, we want that target to be, I don't know, $2 trillion. $2 trillion. They could say, we, we're targeting the M2. M2 is the M0, well, the M1 plus savings accounts and money market accounts. So they could say we're targeting that to be $8 trillion. And just so you know, I actually looked up these numbers. As of at least 05, 06, these numbers weren't that far off. The M0 was more like $800 billion. But just so you get an idea, these are, these are real numbers. So but the, the obvious question is, why don't they do that? Why don't they just grow the money supply? Maybe they say, uh, one thing they could do, they could say, our goal is for M2 to always be, I don't know, 50% of GDP. Right? They could say, let's make it always 50% of GDP. So as the economy grows, we just have to make sure that if it falls below 50% of GDP, that we just have to print a little bit more money, and then it'll have a multiplier effect, and we'll just keep measuring it. If it goes a little bit above, we'll, we'll do some open market operations and sell and sell our treasuries and take reserves out of the banking system. So that's a completely legitimate way of thinking about it. And actually, there are some people who do advocate it this way. And I, I, there is no clear answer to why they're doing this, but I thought about it a little bit. And there's there's two reasons that I can think of why this might make more sense. Although there's there's a part of me, and maybe in a future video, I'll make an argument for why you this actually doing something like managing the money supply to 50% of GDP might actually make a little bit more sense. But anyway, the first reason is kind of one out of convenience, that the short-term interest rate with which banks lend to each other it's just easier to measure than any of these money supply things. If I'm Ben Bernanke and I want to know what 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 banks are lending to each other at, I could I could just sample the market at that moment in time. I could say, oh, you know, I'm a bank. What are you willing to lend to me at? And they'll say, oh, 5.2%. And they're like, oh, that's a little bit above our target. We have to buy more treasuries. So you can get a very real time notion of where the market is. Minute by minute, you don't have to wait for some surveys to get completed or anything like that. While if you were targeting actual money supply, you would have to tabulate these fairly quickly if you wanted real-time information. And that would just be more of a mess. To actually calculate the M2, you'd have to survey the banks. And maybe you could do it with some IT systems. But it's, you're not going to get that real-time information, or at least it would be harder to. The other reason, and this is a little bit more abstract, but I think it'll make sense to you. Let's say it's, it's the autumn. Right? No, no, no. Let's say it's the planting season. I, I've never been a farmer, but I think the planting season sometime in the spring. And let's say there's a couple of farm projects where farm farmers need to borrow money to buy seeds. One of them returns a. The, the farmer will proceed if he can get lending at 20% or lower interest rates. So if someone's willing to lend him money at 21% interest rate, he'll be like, no, that's way too much. But if he can get money at 19% interest rate, he's like, OK, I'll borrow the money and I'll buy the seeds because it, it, it will create so much value that I'll easily be able to pay that, back, that interest. Say there's another farmer with an 18% project. So if he gets 18% or lower interest rates, he'll proceed with his project. And let's say there's another farmer with a, let's say it's a 12% project. If he gets funding at 11%, he'll move forward and he'll buy the seeds and he'll plant them. And let's say there's a couple of other projects in this universe. Let's say you know there's a factory guy. He's got a really good idea, new technology he wants to invest in. And he's going to move forward building the factory if he can get, I don't know, 19% funding. 19% funding. And let's say there's another guy, another factory guy, who would get, I don't know, let me make it, who would get 3% funding. 
So he's not too confident about his project. He thinks that this project only makes sense to move forward if he can get 3% or better funding. So when I say better, less than 3%. My phone is ringing, but I'll ignore it because I'm on a roll. And there's another guy who's really marginal, really shady. He's got a really shady project. He himself is not too confident in it. He will only proceed with this project if he essentially gets money for free. So this is the state of affairs in, in the spring or during the planting season. So, and these are the kind of the, so all of these would be potential consumers of money. And let's say that this is the money supply. Let's say the money supply is fixed at that moment in time. So let's say I have. I'll draw the money supply as circles. So there's three circles of money. Right? So essentially, the money is going to be lent to the people willing to pay the highest interest rate. So in this case, unless, you know, for the sake of simplicity, we're assuming all of these are kind of the same amount of money, just not to make things too complicated. So in a capitalist system, the three best projects will get the money. And so it'll be which ones? It'll be this one, this one, and this one, right? These three guys will get the money. And essentially, they're going to pay the lowest interest rate. They're going to pay the highest interest rate that the worst amongst them is willing to pay. So this money is going to go to these three guys at essentially, let's just say, at 17.9% interest. Right? 17.9% interest. And it's going to be lent to these three guys. Right? And I'm making a lot of simplifying assumptions, but I really just want you to get the underlying idea. And these projects, these three projects, are not going to get done. And you could you might say, well, it's good that society didn't allocate money to this guy and this guy because these were shady projects to begin with. But it's kind of unfortunate. This was a 12% yield project that if somehow the capital was there, we would have gotten a 12% return on society, which is, in, in the big picture of things, a really good project. But the, there just wasn't enough capital at that moment in time. There wasn't enough money at that moment in time to support this project. Fair enough. But let's say the money supply stays constant, or at least in the medium term, over the course of a year. Because that's what the Fed is targeting. So as we get away from the as we get away from the planting season, these projects disappear. These projects disappear. They're no longer there because the planting season isn't there anymore. And let's say you know this guy got done, but let's say there's another project just like it that's 19 percent. And all of a sudden, since the planting season's done, none of the farmers want money anymore. But if you're keeping the money supply constant, now which projects are going to get done? Well, this, this good project here is going to get done. But so are these two kind of crappy projects. And they're going to be lent at a much lower rate. They're going to, it's going to, you know, the average rate that it gets lent to is going to be 1% or 2% or something really low. So what, what you have a situation here is that the money supply did not, it wasn't elastic with the demand. And the negative side effect to society in this situation is, when people needed money, we were passing on good projects that really should have been done because these were really safe projects. And then later, when kind of the timing is bad and we keep the money supply constant, bad projects will get funded because there's just so much money to go around and none of these people need to use it that these really crappy projects that might even be negative. I mean, remember, these are, these are what the investor thinks that they're going to get, but maybe there's a lot of risk and these end up, you know, if, if the investor thinks they're going to get 1% return, maybe they made a mistake. Maybe they'll get a minus 5% return, in which case we're going to be destroying wealth. So this is the problem where over a medium period of time, if you hold the money supply constant, you're not able to, you're, you'll be passing up good You'll be passing up on good projects when there's a lot of demand for them, and then you'll be investing in bad projects when there's a, when there's not much demand for projects. On the other hand, if you had let's do the same scenario over again. I think I made that a little messy. Let's say you have a couple of farmers again. Let me draw a line here. So you had the twenty percent, eighteen percent, twelve percent, and then you had the. In, I'll draw them all in yellow. And then you had the nineteen percent, three percent. And one percent. Now, if if you had if you were managing the money supply to an interest rate, and remember, the interest rate, the federal funds rate, is the rate that banks lend to each other, right? But as we saw, when you inject reserves into the banking system, it lowers the rate that reserves are lent to each other, but it also increases the lending capacity of banks. So it increases the money supply. And so when you increase the money supply overall, the lending capacity, you're also Lowering the rates at which banks lend to projects, right? You're increasing the amount of money. Maybe the projects haven't changed that much. So more money chasing the same number of projects, the cost of lending is going to go down, right? 
So let's say the Fed manages the interest rate in such a way that you know that the Fed target rate was five percent, but let's say that turns into bank lending to real projects at, I don't know, at eight percent. At eight percent. Right? So in this case, we're not fixing the money supply. We're just adjusting the money supply in such a way that the interest rate is fixed. So now during the planting season, which projects are going to get funded? This one, this one, this one, and this one. And these guys are not going to get funded. And then once the planting season is over, we're still keeping the interest rate the same. Maybe we'll contract the money supply in order to keep interest rate. And of course, this isn't what they manage to. They manage to the interbank lending, but it's all related. I just want to give you a sense of why it makes more sense to manage to an interest rate. So once the planting season is over, and some of these projects aren't really available as projects, what were the, these were all the planting projects. In this situation, when we had a constant money supply, we would lend to these crappy projects. But now that we keep the interest rates constant, or relatively fixed, still only the good project is going to get funded. And we don't have to worry about banks just because they're chasing yield and they're so flush with cash that they're chasing bad projects. So that's the underlying rationale, at least from my point of view, why it makes sense to manage to an interest rate as opposed to a money supply. It allows the money supply to, to expand and contract naturally in real time according to market demands for cash. And by setting the interest rate, you're essentially setting the threshold over which you, you're willing to let projects only that meet that threshold get funded and not you know, projects below it that might somehow waste money. Anyway, we'll discuss this a lot more in a lot of different videos and hit it from different angles. But I just wanted to answer those questions, just so you know that you know, this wasn't some convoluted, crazy thing that they're doing, although it is a little bit convoluted. It's just not that crazy. Anyway, see you in the next